Welcome everyone, thanks for coming. So this is, uh, this is uh, another great series of the Talks at Google series, uh, where we invite exciting external speakers to Google to talk about an, a great person's story. So I have two guests that I'm very honored to announce today. It's Ruha. Um, Ruha is, was born in Syria, in Al Hasake, and she had to flee Syria during the war. Um, and she didn't only flee alone, she flew with two sisters, three cousins, and a 96-year-old grandmother uh, on a rubber boat to Europe. Um, so she's going to tell us about that story, um, how, she, how she managed to do that, what that did that mean for her life. Um, and also she's now working in a Swiss NGO to help other uh, refugees and she's a translator there. So she hears not only her own, um, she not only has her own memories, but also hears a lot from other refugees um, and has insights based on that. Um, and to end on a happy note, I can already tell you that family was in the end happily reunited in Sweden. So uh, it is somewhat of a happy ending of a, of a difficult story. So welcome to her. And then I have Aisha over there, Aisha Keller. Um, she is Scottish, so she was born in Edinburgh in 89. She helped found an NGO that takes care um, for refugees that are affected by the Syrian um, crisis. Um, she builds, for example, she has projects to build better housing, dignified housing in Greece. So that's a big part of the story you're going to tell us, um, what you did there and how that helps. Uh, it's an NGO called Together for Better Days. So we're going to hear about that NGO specifically also a bit. Um, and actually, Aisha also spent a year on the ground in Greece. It's a very practical experience. So I'm going to hand it over to Aisha um, to um, please tell us about uh, your story. Thank you very much, Raphael. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Shall I? Thank you. And yeah, so we are going to tell you uh, our personal story of this experience and then at the end we'll be very open to taking questions as well. So my story starts in Edinburgh in Scotland where I grew up and I had a very happy childhood, a very protected childhood, um, in a way for many of us a very normal childhood and the closest I got to knowing about war and the atrocities that connected to that was in my history lessons where I quite naively felt that that was something in the past and we'd obviously learned from our mistakes and I would never, I would be luckily would never have to experience something like that again. As my activism was occasionally marching with some friends to make poverty history or whatever it was that was happening in the town at the time but um, yeah I didn't expect to ever really have to deal with these things and I was very focused on wanting to start a business. So I went to university, I studied in Sunderland and Berlin and I also lived in Newcastle and um, studied business and did quite a lot of travelling. I also after school went on a gap year and travelled around the world and for me freedom of movement was just something that was very intrinsic to being human. It was way before I even knew of this expression of freedom of movement. I've lived in, in I don't know, seven different countries, travelled in over 40. It just seems quite a normal thing to do. So following my studies, or actually during my studies, I did an internship not so far from here at the Bordensee, a really beautiful place. And there was also where I, at the time, met my boyfriend. And after um, finishing my studies, uh, we moved back to Zurich, so I actually lived here in Zurich for two years. And my time in Switzerland was really nice. It's a beautiful country. My, I had a very comfortable life. I had a good job in a very corporate environment, um, had good career progression opportunities. Life was good, um, comfortable, possibly just kind of after a while got a I got the feeling I was in a bubble. Uh, more and more I was hearing about the news around me of what was happening in the rest of the world and I just realised that I was in a very small percentage of people that had a very easy life and that maybe that wasn't the case for everyone and I just wanted to know more about the world. So that drove me to quit my job and leave everything behind in Switzerland and for the next couple of months I was travelling through Europe, interviewing a lot of different companies, a lot of startups, and um, all over and finding out about all these different projects and innovations and things that were going on which were very interesting 
And during that time, in November, actually it was before then, we saw that first picture of Ellen Kurdi washed up on the shores of Turkey. And that's when the world media became aware of the crisis. And so I also became aware of the crisis. So it was in the back of my mind and I'd been thinking for a while, yeah, like going to Greece, that could be interesting, maybe Calais or maybe, but didn't actually take that step. So when I saw a friend of mine in November had posted on Facebook saying, I'm going to Greece. And um, I, I commented saying, that sounds amazing. And she was like, oh, why don't you come with me? And five days later, I was on a flight to Last Bus, um, only for a week, just to go and see, because I felt that the media representation must be completely exaggerated. There's no way in, that in my Europe that respects human rights and everything else that this could possibly be happening. So I just thought, might as well go and have a look. When I got there, what I experienced and what I saw touched and moved me in such a way that one year later I was still there. So when we arrived in Greece, I arrived at around the same time as thousands of other volunteers were arriving from all over the world and at the same time as thousands of refugees were also arriving. So it was a big meeting of people on a very small tourist island. Um, as you can see here, the background, those are the mountains of Turkey. And on the left, we've got this little rubber dinghy and one of the border patrol boats. Most volunteers would arrive by flying in on a budget airline or getting a 10 euro ferry from Turkey. For the refugees, they had to risk their lives on incredibly overcrowded boats, costing thousands per person, depending which smuggler they haggled with. So it was a very, very surreal experience. And arriving there and seeing what was going on, it just felt unreal. And I couldn't quite come to terms with it. And it was because of that that, together with other independent volunteers, we came together and started an NGO. It was not planned. It was very much in response to what was happening. So in Greece, many, many people arrived and we had, yeah, it was one of the biggest migrations we've had since the Second World War and people would arrive on the coasts and then once they'd arrived on the coast, they would all come to Moria. Moria was a central uh, registration centre, so everybody would come through there. We had volunteers also really coming from everywhere, like I said. So in Moria, we set up an organization at the time, it was called Better Days for Moria. And we had around, it's, it's hard to know the exact numbers because we didn't start registrations till much later because it was really a grassroots response. So the processes and systems grew as we grew. But we, we estimate probably around 5,000 volunteers came through our projects and around about the time 200,000 um, refugees were arriving and went through the project as well. So a lot of people from a lot of different countries. It, while I was in Switzerland, I lived what one might in many ways say was a normal life. But in many ways, I felt very disconnected from life. And what I experienced in Lesvos was so real and so moving and so touching and this connection with people was just really beautiful and tragic at the same time and this way that you would build trust and connection with people that you had never met before was really quite very very special and so in a way felt more real than anything else I'd experienced even though we were in this very strange situation. Yeah, <laughs> I, really, I really like this picture. It's um, just yeah, one of those experiences of one of the many, many, many people I, I met. When people arrived, they often had very wet shoes and feet. And in the middle of the winter, it gets very cold in Greece. A lot of people don't realize that it goes to minus degrees and snows. So one of the main things we did when people got off the boats was putting emergency foil into the shoes and giving people new socks. So one lady I met, never met her again, no idea where she is, but we had millions of these connections going on, which I think was very beautiful. So this was the camp. This was the camp we set up as Better Day Samoya. It was the Olive Grove camp. So 
in, at the peak of the arrivals in October, there were up to 10,000 people arriving per day. The Moria Registration Center officially had capacity for a few hundred. Um, if you crammed it full, you could fit about 3,000. But either way, you've got a lot of extra people who are not going to fit in. So they're waiting on the surrounding olive grove for up to a week, sometimes longer, depending how quick the registrations were happening, depending. We never really knew. When there was a government visit, it all went really quickly. When there wasn't a government visit, it could take a long time. It really depended. So we set up an emergency response camp. When we arrived in November, the situation wasn't nice. There was a lot. It was basically full of rubbish. People were burning rubbish to stay warm. There was no proper accommodation. There was no medical cover. There was no food. There were a lot of volunteers sporadically turning up and trying to help out, but there were no real systems in place. So we s founded the organization as a way to bring some structure to the chaos. So we then, over time, together with many other partners and many other organizations, had 24-hour medical care, 24-hour clothing distribution, 24-hour food, 24-hour information, shelter, everything like that. So if people arrived at 2 a.m., which was usually the case, people came at night, really wet, really cold in the middle of winter, and there was a real danger of hypothermia, we could get people into dry clothes as quickly as possible, give them a warm soup, a warm chai, um, give them the information they needed as to what the next steps were and move people on. So that was our main focus, was the survival. However, what underpinned that and always underpinned that was we also wanted to make people feel welcome. So the idea was one, we want you to survive, really important and was a major topic that we needed to work on. But we also wanted to have a, like an oasis of warmth in a way in, in a very difficult journey. We knew people had a hard journey behind them. We knew they would have a hard journey ahead of them and we wanted a time when they could come together and just feel human and be recognized as a human being with hopes and dreams and aspirations and not just as a statistic or as a number on a registration paper. So a lot of what we did as well was creating this community and most of our services could not have run if we didn't also have the support of the refugees, especially translation, but everything. So clothing distribution, food distribution, we really work together as a community. And that was very beautiful. And I must say, we often got, we had mainly single men on our camp because the priority for inside the compound was for family and children. So at night it was mainly single men and they get so much bad press and people are like, oh, it'd be really dangerous if you have thousands of single men from all over the world in one camp, they'll probably fight all the time. Absolutely not the case. We had very little conflict. Only when all the borders closed and everyone felt really desperate did any kind of violence break out. And even then it was never towards any of the volunteers and always quite more in a protest manner rather than in an aggression towards anyone. It was a really weirdly beautiful um, place in amongst this complete chaos. Yeah, this was our tea tent where everyone who arrived got served warm tea. Then the borders started closing and well, it already started for some people um, around Christmas when the North Africans could no longer cross and the Pakistanis could no longer cross and the Afghans could no longer cross. I still remember the morning I came up onto camp and there were just so many Afghans outside the info tent and I was like, what's going on? And they said, oh, our friends at the Domaini board have just told us that the Afghans can no longer cross. So I called one of my friends at the Domaini board. I was like, what's going on? They said, yeah, they just closed it, but then they've just reopened it and let a few families through. And now they've literally just closed it again. We're not really sure. There was no official news. So Moyo was really a place where you could feel the crisis. We found out about it before it hit the news. It was instant. We really this bottleneck where you really felt what was happening along the whole route. So once that happened, then the EU-Turkey deal came into effect in March, which was this agreement between Europe and Turkey that Turkey would try and prevent people from coming and in return Europe would give them a lot of money and um, they would resettle people legally. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work. Um, and even then, we were very, very skeptical of it. The difficult thing about the EU-Turkey deal was it came into effect overnight before the papers had even been released. So nobody actually knew what it was. They just knew it was a thing that had been agreed. So 
the lawyers were all scratching their heads, looking very confused. The politicians were making grand announcements about how this was going to solve everything. And the people who were actually responsible, like the police and the border controls and the army, just didn't really know. And so almost in a kind of let's make sure we don't make a mistake response, they just locked the whole thing down and overnight it became a prison. So suddenly all the children, the parents, the unaccompanied minors, the families, the men, everybody got locked into this detention centre. It was incredibly overfilled and suddenly our only way to reach these people was through fences again. So we were having to pass clothes and food and so on through the fences. And it was very sad because we'd finally established systems that worked and we felt quite confident and then overnight it all got destroyed. In retaliation to that, there was a lot of protests inside the camp. Uh, most of the human rights experts, if not all of them, plus many of the world leaders, well, not world leaders, but kind of experts in the field of human rights and law and so on, were saying that the law was illegal. Um, well, it wasn't a law, it was an agreement. And everybody was very confused as to what was happening next and what would happen. So there was a lot of peaceful protests happening inside the camp um, for weeks. This eventually, after over a month of nothing changing and not enough food and a lot of other problems, escalated into rioting and more extreme protesting where things were burnt down. Unfortunately, that's incredibly effective. Suddenly the press turns up, um, there's pressure and people were allowed out. So unfortunately, often the peaceful protests have very little effect and um, violence does. Um, they, again, no one was hurt. It was just built burning down things and making big kind of notice us moves. Even when it was open, it was still kind of a detention centre because in order to go through the asylum process, you have to wait for your number to be called. And the numbers get called over the loudspeaker. So if you go into town and you miss your number being called, you miss your chance. So even though officially the gates were open, the systems weren't in place to actually allow people to leave. This meant we weren't very happy either. Suddenly I ended up at many, many protests. Almost every day we were protesting, speaking to journalists, trying to raise our voices, saying this is not okay, we're not okay with this. I never thought I was gonna end up an activist. I thought I would spend most of my life in a business suit. And instead suddenly I was there running around with we love you signs and the whistle, um, trying to attract attention to the fact that I was not okay as a European having human rights just walked all over. During this time, I also spent a lot of time speaking to the press. Um, they really came from all over the world. So this was, well, Australia, America, Germany, UK, really everywhere. I did a lot of interviews. And um, this was really nice. And it was a very positive experience for the refugees as well because it felt like they hadn't been forgotten and there were people who cared. Unfortunately, now people are pretty much forgotten about it. It's not in the news very much anymore. The conditions in Moria now are worse than they were a year ago. And yet you rarely hear about it. So it's actually a shame that the media has kind of gone on to other stories like, yeah, whatever else is going on. So once Moria closed and we realised that we couldn't continue doing anything there, we lovingly said goodbye to Lasva, set up a legal programme to help the people inside Moria and went on to northern Greece, which is where the main things were happening with the Idomeni border. There we set up a new pilot project in refugee accommodation. This was quite an interesting project because it was a public-private partnership. So it was an official Greek camp, um, recognised by the government, but funded by philanthropy money from a Canadian philanthropy organisation and run by volunteers, which was our organisation. We rebranded us together for better days because we were no longer Moria. And together with the residents, so here's one of the forums we had, um, we really worked at building dignified systems. So rather than handing out clothes, we actually created a clothing shop where people have credits so that they can come in and buy things. Actually, really recently, there's a new development from tech, tech UGs um, who came in and did a, did a sort of study and they've set up a, an IT system now to be able to uh, manage all of that properly. So there's a lot of innovation and some really cool stuff happening. 
Again, our focus was one, to make sure the basic minimum standards were met. We were the only camp at the time, possibly still are, in northern Greece that meets the basic humanitarian standards as set up by SPHERE, even though they're very, very basic. Um, and once we had that covered, like no one's going to die, then the focus is on education, activities, and so on, basically to keep people entertained until they get their decision, which can be months, and nobody knows. They're literally just waiting. They get a phone call and then they can go, but there's no kind of appointment, so you're literally just waiting and waiting, and it can be a month, it can be a year. So there's a lot of frustration and boredom, so that was one of the focuses on what can we do while we're waiting. The food was amazing. <laughs> we, one of the big things we had is we realised for people, cooking is a very important part of culture. So we set up again a market where people could buy their stuff with credits and then they could cook in the communal kitchen and would have big community feasts. And the really nice thing about Elpida, it means hope in Greek, um, but the really nice thing was that it was a community project where people worked together and where we worked with the community to, to run this camp. Um, it worked really well. The idea was it would be a pilot and it would be rolled out across many other places. Unfortunately, it hasn't um, for many reasons, I guess, mainly political. Um, so it's, it's still there, but it doesn't look like it's going to be copied at the moment. We'll see. We'll see. But the, the options are there. I think one thing that's really important to be aware of is that the problems, most of the problems have been solved. The solutions are there. It's always the question if you want to implement it or not. And that's the kind of main barriers that we come across. And it's the main reason why I left Greece and I'm now kind of going around Europe talking because I want to make people aware that the solutions are there, we need to have a will to implement them. So in my, my real wish for the world would be to end all war and conflict and all of those bad things, but I know that's very idealistic and utopian and it's probably not going to happen. But in the meantime, I think what I really hope is that we have this courage to look for solutions and not to give up and to keep our keep our minds open and curious and awake to try and find solutions to these problems because they are there and we just need to have the will to implement them. Thank you, Aisha. I would like to thank everyone to show up again from Osmo. Um, my name is Roha Saeed. I am from uh, Al Hasaki in Syria, that is in the northern eastern corner of Syria. I grew up in a uh, nice city, actually a quite big city, but the society I grew up in was a simple society, full of m many, many relatives. Uh, I had a very happy childhood. I went to, uh, I went to from uh, private primary school and then to a governmental secondary and uh, a high school. And then I have to move to Damascus to study at the university. Uh, this is the uh, art and uh, humanitic, humanitic science of uh, Damascus University. This is the facility. Yeah, and uh, the society in Damascus was much, uh, was much more different than the society in, in Hasake. It was a bigger society. We were uh, we were students from all over Syria together, sitting in this in, in, in the same auditorium. So it was a little bit difficult for me to uh, blend in among these all, all all these students. But I, some way, I managed to uh, to get used to it, and I made some good friends. But I am in touch with uh, very very few of them at the moment. And uh, then uh, in March 2011, the revolution started. My only definition of war was the one I, I read in history books in school, but then I saw it happening in front of my own eyes. Um, uh, all, all the people were shouting at the beginning that this was a peaceful revolution, but this was not what the government had in mind. Um, uh, this is a picture of uh, a suburb of Al Hasaki. Uh, I was in 
I was in Damascus when it started to happen. Uh, I realized that every, everything was changing really quickly. We had, uh, we, were, we had soldiers and guns all over the place. Uh, prices of food, of books, of transportation were doubled and then tripled. And then uh, we couldn't feel any secure anymore. Like fear and insecurity was pres were present in every step of my life. So I decided to, quick, to quit uh, at the university and then go back home. And then I went back home to find the market looks like this. Um, it was not much. It was not much different than the situation in Damascus. So we realized that we did have to do something about this. We realized that if you wanted a better life, then we have to move. Uh, me and my father used to talk very frequently about the situation, and then we decided to move on to Iraq. But we couldn't due to financial problems. And then my father uh, moved to, uh, travel to Sweden. And that was on, the, on February, late February 2014. And after that, uh, in uh, September 2014, I moved with my whole family to Turkey, uh, with my family and with my, uh, my aunt's family also. I, uh, we sold the house in order to be able to move to Turkey. I was working in a sewing factory. I started working right away. Uh, we sew clothes for children, and uh, again, it was difficult for me to fit in this new society with a new language, with uh, so so many different people. They were not similar to uh, to where I grew up, and to and the, um, I was paid seven thousand seven hundred sorry seven hundred Turkish lira. That is less than 200 Swiss franc per month. And after, after a while, after learning the language, I felt myself a little bit more, a little bit more or less um, using, getting used to this new society. I made a couple of friends there. And then in, two, in 2015, December 2015, my mother, my young, my young brother, and my youngest sister were able to move to Sweden due to family reunification. And a um, couple of days later, we found out that we were rejected. We, as me, my two younger sisters, and my 92, my 96-year-old grandmother, we were rejected. So um, we had no idea what to do back then. Uh, it was really, it was really hard. To, to think what to do. And then uh, after my mother leaving, it was difficult for me to go to work and then leaving my sisters with my grandmother back home. And then I had to quit working and we had to make the journey to Greece uh, and then take the Balkan route to try to go to Sweden. This is my grandmother on the boat. Um, coming to Greece was the experience that changed my life. Um, actually, the smuggler told us that the boat would be uh, a big boat, but it wasn't. We were supposed to be uh, 15 people on the boat, but we were 23 people. And uh, it was supposed to be from uh, a point that called Cheshme in Turkey, but it was from a different one, a more difficult, far away one that takes much more time. And we were, um, we ended up in a place on Lesbos Island, a place that people say, volunteers say that no boat has ever arrived before nor after. Yeah, so we were the first and the last. <laughs> um, uh, the trip was very scary. It was the scariest part of my life. And it's so strange that I can remember each and every second of that day. Um, uh, when we were at the point to take off, we found out that everything was a lie, so we decided not to go forward. We decided to go back, but then searching for the cars, everyone was dis everyone had disappeared. No one was there. They disappeared like lightning. And uh, so we had to we had to step in the, into this boat. I was the first one to go in, and then my sisters, and then my grandmother. My grandmother was in complete absence. She could not realize anything of, the, of what's going around her. 
uh, I had one of my sister, each one of them clinging to one of my arms, screaming and crying, oh, how we're going to die, we're going to die. Um, as I could feel the boat shaking and between, uh, underneath my legs, I couldn't think or feel anything. I was very scared, but I had it to, I had it to act very strong for my sisters and my grandmother. It's, um, it was really one of the moments that I still, I mean, talking about it is still like a movie. I cannot believe that that has happened to me. We started uh, sailing. Uh, the trip took three and a half hours. The engine stopped twice. Every, everyone was in complete panic. I tried calling the Greek coast guards, but they put my call, they put my call on wait. That was not uh, no help of no help. And then um, the only moment that, that I can clearly remember was the moment when I lift up my head and I could see the this huge mountain um, uh, beside me. You can see this, that mountain. This is uh, the island. Where, this is the place where we, where we landed. Yeah, we could land safely, thank God. And we had to climb uh, up the hill in, uh, in the dark. And with, uh, we, we were hearing all the voices from animals. We were very scared. But my grandmother was really tired and we couldn't climb up, so we had to go back. And then uh, out of nowhere, this yellow van shows up. I had no idea that there were volunteers at that time. I had no idea that the, the borders were closed at that time. I was thinking that this is a matter of 10 days and I will be home safe. But it took me six months to arrive at last. Uh, uh, this van showed up, and uh, the woman sitting in front, Raquel Herzog, she was the first person I spoke to. I ran to her and I asked for help. Please, can you help us? We have uh, two other ladies, two old ladies with us, and uh, they need, we need help at, right away. So everyone was on the van, and we were we were taken to the to the main street, and then we were taken by police buses to the Moria camp where we registered, and then I had, we stayed there for a night, and uh, finding out the situation in Moria was completely difficult for my grandmother to survive. I had to find a better place with a, with a small amount of money I had. We rented an, uh, uh, a room, it was more or less a room, with uh, 10 beds. We stayed there for a couple of nights, and then Raquel helped, Raquel helped me to find an apartment. And then she helped me to uh, she helped me to work uh, to work with uh, with NGOs with the organizations there. And uh, the only thing that I am most thankful for is I I was able to go back to that place in day, day, uh, daylight. <coughs> this is how it looks. Um, this was one of the moments that I can never forget because I have. This was the time I realized that that place was not ugly. That place was not scary. It was actually a beautiful place. It was one of the most beautiful places I, I've ever seen. And that's why I could feel a little bit more safe, a little bit more comfortable about moving on and, and continuing living. Uh, I was able to work as a volunteer. Uh, with uh, Sao, with uh, Better Days, Together for Better Days. Well, actually, at that time it was Together for uh, Better Days for Moria. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was there to, uh, this is one of the boat arrivals. I really wanted to be at one of the boat arrivals. And uh, this was one of the experiences that really moved me and touched me. Uh, the boat was from Iraq. They were all Kurdish people, and all the volunteers there were uh, Arabic. They were yelling at the people in Arabic, like, stop, don't put your children in the water, but no one seems to understand. I was shaking before that, but then I realized that these people need help. So I ran to the boat. I started screaming in Kurdish, like, stop, you cannot put your children into water. These are good people. They are volunteers. They will help you. They will welcome you. And yeah, that was one of the moments that made me much more stronger.
uh, that shaped my personality, more or less. And then from that time on, I did work with uh, many NGOs, with journalists, with uh, directors from uh, the UK, from the US, and um, uh, Raquel helped me to find a lawyer to appeal the rejection decision we had, but the appeal was rejected once more. And then at last I had to, um, I had to take a plane to Sweden. And this was the moment me and my grandmother arrived. My grandmother, again, did not realize anything. She only realized the fact that we were reunited when she saw my mother the, on the right of the picture. She started crying. And uh, a couple of days afterwards, Raquel visited us in Sweden. And uh, yeah, that was most, most of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, maybe to follow up, Rohan, on what you... So I actually have two questions to you. So the one is, if I understand correctly, you had to flee twice, right? You fled yeah. your hometown yeah. and then you went on a boat. Yeah. In each of those moments, can you uh, talk a bit more about what that means? I mean, none of us have experienced that, right? What makes... What's the moment when you realize, I have to do this? None of, none of us knows that. And I wish none of us would ever be forced to go through that experience because it is really difficult that you have to leave everything you know, the whole places, your studies, everything, you have to leave them behind you and then go to a place where you have no clue, where you have um, zero skills, language, and it's really um, difficult. But the, 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 the situation was really hard. But in Syria and then in Turkey, it was really hard that you could re you realize that you cannot take this anymore. Like in Syria, the war is really in my home in my hometown. There wasn't bombing all the time. There wasn't, but the the, the military was there present all the time. Each ten days, we had a car bombing or a person bombing, or and then people dying. And then you have prices going up like crazy. You have um, people aren't able to go study. People like life literally stops. And then you realize it's either me taking a step forward or me accepting dying slowly in this place. And that's why you would say nothing is more difficult than staying here, than moving on, but staying here. So I choose to move on in both times. You mentioned you had smugglers, you had people that helped you or, or try to help you. Talk a bit about the logistics, because I guess it's so hard to imagine for us, right? So do you know, how, how did you know what to do? How did you, did, did you always get help? Did you get the right help? How, how is the, this must be crazy logistics. I really didn't know what to do. <laughs> I had no idea what I'm doing. I had no idea that. This, is this the right thing to do? Is, it, is this the, the it, would this be acceptable? Would this do good? Or would, would it be bad? Would it bring it to a, a worse place? But I was lucky. I was really lucky in each time. I was lucky in, in Turkey to uh, meet a couple of good people. And I was lucky in Greece to meet people like Raquel and Aisha. I, yeah, I think, I think it's very difficult to define the logistics, but they're there. If I can turn it to, to Aisha and, and maybe ask you um, a couple of questions. Um, so you mentioned things have evolved a bit since you went there. Can you maybe summarize again, how is the situation better or worse or, or different from when you first went there to today? So it's incredibly different. Um, I think the, one of the reasons the news have kind of forgotten about it is because the arrival numbers have dropped significantly. Uh, there still are hundreds of people arriving every week, so still quite a lot of people, but compared to the thousands before, it's a huge drop. So 
I think it feels in a way when you look at it from the outside as if it's not as bad because you don't have those scenes of so many people and lying on the beach and pe children being washed up and things like that. However, unfortunately, because there's no movement forward anymore and because a lot of the borders are closed, the schemes aren't really working, people are stuck. And so they're stuck behind these fences and they just don't know what's going to come next. So the desperation, the, the depression is just getting really quite unbearable for many, many people. And I think that's um, the main difference is it's become kind of quiet. It's become the silent, invisible pain that people have, uh, which in a way is a lot more dangerous because it's a lot easier to, to ignore. You mentioned you is sort of you're now active in this NGO that you co-founded, right? Talk a bit about what you can do from here now, since you're not on the ground anymore. You mentioned a few things already, but what is sort of what are the goals? Where can you influence? Where can you actually you can support try from here? Going back one, there we go. And there are many ways you can get involved. Um, really easy, obvious ones are donating, um, but it doesn't have to be that. I think one of the most important things is to stay informed. I think one of the main reasons these things are happening is because people aren't really aware. I always think if people really knew what was happening, it wouldn't happen. Um, but if you, it's quite easy to ignore, especially if people aren't reporting on it. Um, I think it's really important to meet refugees, um, speak to people, and realize that they're just humans. I think for me, Meeting Ruha in, in Greece was a really amazing experience because she speaks so good English and my Arabic is pretty much non-existent. So until that moment, I hadn't really had a chance to have a really good conversation with another woman in my age, basically. And sitting down with her made me realize it could have been me. I was born in Scotland, not Syria, but who knew? Like neither of us would have known this was going to happen. And I think that realization that we're just the same, actually, it really helps to put everything into context. So I think it's important rather than seeing some of the, I don't know how it is in Switzerland. In the UK, the media is very afraid of refugees. All the headlines are basically about fear. And I think it's very easy to be afraid of something you don't understand. If you understand and you know the person, you can't be afraid of them. Like, I don't think I could be afraid of you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sometimes, but no, in general, it, it becomes ridiculous. I mean, you're even laughing about the idea. It's completely insane, and it is. And that's, but, but how would you know if you hadn't, if I hadn't had that interaction? So I think that's very helpful. And I think keeping an open mind is really important and speaking up. So when people say things about, refugees that you maybe don't agree with, that you say, hey, I, I actually don't agree with that, or even like, why exactly do you think that? Have you actually spoken to someone? Where are you getting these figures from? Because a lot of these figures are also vastly inflated. I think it's really important to be aware that in 2015, around 850,000 people came over from Turkey to, uh, to Greece, and that meant they were all trying to get into Europe. That meant Europe increased its population by 0.2%. In Lebanon, at the moment, we've got an increase of about um, 20, 25%, depends which statistic you're looking at. So it's a huge difference. 0.2%, it's, it's kind of nothing. And so in a way, people get so afraid of these big numbers, but when you put it into comparison, it suddenly isn't that big a number. So it just needs to be managed properly and then you don't have the issues. I'm not saying there aren't problems, there are problems, but I think the problems are to do with the way the crisis has been managed and the way solutions have been implemented and not because of the situation. 0.2% isn't a big deal. If you don't manage it properly, it can become a big deal. If I may turn it to Rua again and just ask you, because you mentioned already you were a translator, you on the ground, in a sense, it sounded like you turned from a refugee to a supporter at some point as well, right? Which is, which is, I think, amazing. And I can see why, why that uh, w was important for you. H how is that today? I mean, are you, are you actively working with that NGO? What is your role in that? Uh, what are your connections, actually? Um, I would have to say that that did really, uh, it had a very big part in, sh in shaping me and in making me me. I am much more stronger than I was, and I am still in. Uh, I am still working with Saul, 
as a cultural advisor. We are, uh, hopefully, we are planning to open uh, a women's center in Greece, and that's still, that's still a plan. There is not, not much about that, but hopefully. And I'm still in touch with many of the women I knew, with many of the women I met, and... Uh, and may I ask, did you exchange phone numbers or yes. Facebook? How, how do you stay in touch with people that you meet under such desperate conditions? Yes, we did change uh, Facebook contact because the phone numbers were really uh, unstable. Yeah, uh, we changed Facebook contact and we are, I am still, as I said, in contact with many of them. Good, then I would say I want to thank you really very, very much for, for sharing your, both your personal stories and what you do. Um, I want to thank you, everybody, for coming, and I want to end it with here. Thanks a lot, both of you. Thank you.